Fuse Festival. Arielle Hyatt here, and I'm thrilled to have our special keynote guest, Mr. Seth Godin. Hi, Seth. Wait, wait. I was supposed to say Seth Godin's here, and I'm <laughs> thrilled to have our special guest, Ariel Hyatt. They don't know how lucky they are to have you. <laughs> They've seen me before. It's boring now. Old news. But, um, okay, we could say that, too. So I want to dive right in because our time is short and we've got a lot of questions that came in from Twitter and Facebook and also we want to talk about your new book, We Are All Weird. And in it, you talk about mass versus weird. Can you give those that haven't seen it yet the highlights? The word normal is a very loaded term. It started in statistics and what it says is that there's a distribution bell curve. We've all seen the bell curve a million times before. For example, if I had everyone in the room line up in order of height, there'd be a few people who are under five feet tall and a few people who are over six six, but most people would be in the center. And that's called the normal distribution. And the word normal merely means you're all lumped up in the middle. And most people who make music, draw paintings, make uh, scissors or pencils or computers or anything, care about the middle of the market because there's more people in the middle. And so this notion that normal was the way things are supposed to be became important. And so we started making fun of kids on the playground by saying, you're not normal, you're weird, as if there's something wrong with that. And what's been happening for just the last 20 years is that bell curve is melting. And all the people in the middle are oozing out to the edges. So now you got people who like Harley Davidson motorcycles, and you got people who spend four hours a day doing crochet, and you got people who are really into playing with this kind of technology, and people who have no technology, and you have people who are on super far right, and you got people in the Green Party, and everyone is just oozing to the edges. Because the internet does two things. First, it lets weird people find other weird people, which amplifies their weirdness, right? So you have three tattoos, that's not a lot compared to your friend who has nine, so you get more tattoos. And the second thing it does is it lets marketers like us, anyone who makes something they want to talk about, reach groups of people who aren't the normal ones. In fact, reaching the masses is too expensive now, but reaching just the people who are into experimental lesbian fiction, that's easy because you can find those people. And so what it means if you're a musician or an artist or someone who makes pencils, is you better make something for weird people. And what it means to us as a culture and a society is enough with the bullying and enough with pushing people away because they're not normal, because no one's normal. And let's get our arms around the fact that given the choice, people will make a choice. And that the bravery of standing up for what you love and believe in is what it means to be human. Mm. Mm. Amazing. So my favorite quote from the book, I'm going to read it, is, if you persist trying to be all things to all people, you will fail. The only alternative then is to be something important to a few people. And to get there, you must disappoint some slightly engaged normal folks who can live just fine without you. And I find um, at Cyber PR we represent usually about a hundred artists at a time, that there's this fear around disappointing people. There's yeah. also a lot of fear around, you call it being weird, um, around just declaring who you are. So, you know, if you say, oh, I sound like um, Bob Dylan or I sound like Peter Gabriel, people that don't like those two artists might immediately not like you, and that's okay. Um, how do we overcome our fear of disappointing people? Well, if you find out, you should tell me, because I have it too. Uh, I, would, I would start by saying the following. You can never rationalize your way out of fear. I can explain to you all day long that airplane travel is safer than cars, but if you're afraid of being on an airplane, it's not going to help. For me, I think fear of something else helps get rid of the first fear. So if you're afraid of snakes and the dark, but you have to run across a dark room to get away from some snakes, you probably will, because snakes are scarier than the dark. So the message to the musician is, you should be more afraid of being obscure. You should be more afraid of being ignored. You should be more afraid of no one ever hearing you than you should be afraid of disappointing a few people. That's number one. The second thing I would propose is something that I've been doing for two years and I'm thrilled. 
do not read reviews. Do not let people post comments on your site. If they don't like it, if they don't get the joke, they're dead to you. Move on. There are people out there with an open heart who can't wait to hear from you. You don't need to spend any time with the haters. The haters are going to hate, and it's not your job to make them happy. Mm, I totally agree with that. Um, I always tell artists that I believe that the creative mind will directly fight the marketing mind. And I have a job, and seven people work for us because... People hate marketing. Musicians hate marketing so much. They'd rather put that into the hands of other people. And recently, a little bit to our utter dismay, we've started tweeting for people, blogging for people, Facebooking for people, because they refuse to do it and they don't like it. How do you work with or what do you say to, to creative types that feel like they're carnival barkers when it comes to marketing, which is now an utter necessity if you're going to make it on any level in today's music industry? Well, your question is all around one word, which is marketing. Mm. Marketing in 1952 meant one thing, and we could all agree what it was, advertising. And if you are one of the madman guys, your job was to put on commercials. It has now become this extraordinarily complicated nest of stuff. And I don't think you can say, I hate marketing or I love marketing, because what is it? Are we talking about spamming? Are we talking about speaking up for what you believe in or somewhere in between? So what I believe is this. You cannot be a musician and you cannot be an artist until you acknowledge that one of the things you're trying to do is make a dent in the universe, that you're trying to touch people. Otherwise, just play in your garage and never make a record, never put anything out in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're trying to touch people, guess what marketing is? Marketing is finding out the best way to touch people and to touch them in a way that resonates enough that they tell their friends. Mm -hmm. So if you insist on outsourcing all of that, what you have to understand is you just hired someone not as good as you to go tell your story. And I'm not buying that. I think that you should look at the new marketing as a chance to be you. And you need to hire someone like Ariel to say, how can you amplify that story I just told? How can you do it in more places, maybe a little louder? How can you take care of the odds and ends? But someone needs to tell a story. And if it's not you, then what are we paying you for? Right. Um, in your book, you talk about this new opportunity that was born within the last 20 years uh, in even just the eight years since we've been doing online marketing and, and since artists have, were forced onto my space. Um, you say the opportunity for small businesses, in our case, independent artists, um, to sell what no one else will sell and engage in the way no one else will engage. And you say three things that I think are critical for you all to understand who are watching this. This is the really the first time in history that you can reach your potential tribe members, and Seth can talk about what that means, organize them in whatever way you see fit, whether it's on Pinterest or Twitter or on your Facebook pages or through your blog or through taking photos of them, and then do business with them. And that's, again, the piece that we see missing all the time, even the artists that are beginning to understand how to get social, how to engage, and how to do it well, they're missing the business piece. And I think uh, part of that is the business is, is a bit gone, right? We're not selling CDs anymore. A lot of us don't quite understand about how to create new products and services and goods for fans. Um, can you give us some examples of some artists or businesses that you've seen doing a kick-ass job with that? Let's start with this. You used to A musician in 1970 or 80 or 90 was looking for a job, and the job was to fill a slot in the store. So the record label would hire musicians. Don't even imagine that those guys were independent. They were hired by record labels, paid up front, to make the song of the week or the song of the month. And if it sold, then they got to do it again, right? And that slot-filling activity is what sort of created our vision of what the rock star does. Well, now there are no slots left because mm. there's no retail left. So please understand there's more music than ever before, more opportunity than ever before, but the music industry is dead. And so what you actually do for a living now has nothing to do with what Neil Diamond did for a living. Mm -hmm. What you do for a living is you lead a group of fans who want you to take them somewhere and who want to hang out with the other fans. 
those two things. So the Grateful Dead is the model. They are the Apple computer of the music industry in that they did it right and consistently and became a legend. And I can give you 50 smaller examples. But what the Dead said was, all the music is free. If you want to listen, it's our privilege to play for you. But if you want to hang out with the other Deadheads, did I break something? Nope, we're good. Okay. I think it's if you want to, If you want to hang out with the other people who like our music... That costs $30. Mm-hmm. And so they put on a party every night for 10,000 people who each paid 30 bucks. That's $300,000 a night so that the 10,000 people could come together because there was no other place they could do that. Mm-hmm. So my friend Moby makes $200,000 on a good night by himself putting on a party, right? right? You can hear his music all you want without him. But if you want to be in the room with the other people, you got to have Moby there too. And so Keller Williams, also worth Googling, Keller has put up all his music online for free. He's extraordinarily talented, a very generous guy. He can fill a room any night he wants, anywhere in the United States. He just emails the list, and they all come. That's his job now. Not to fill a slot, but to lead a group and to connect them. And if you're not prepared to do that, then I think you should not try to make money as a musician. If you're not prepared to do that, the only other alternative is to make your music, put it online for free, and go do a day job. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Keller. I used to work for him when he was first signed. And there was something about Keller, and this is another point that Seth talks about and something that I preach as well, that Keller Williams is remarkable. The man and just his guitar with what he's able to do, the reason why he had success that's still building 15 years later is... He is thrilling to watch. For any of you who don't know who he is, Google him and watch some of his videos. He was a sensation because he's so amazing. So I think the cornerstone of all of this marketing is you've got to make sure you've got something so good that people want and spread. Um, And you talk a lot about that, Seth, in pretty much all of your books, that unless people are passing on information about you, what you do, who you are, you're really dead in the water. How do we overcome what might happen if we put something out into the world and it lands and flatlines? Well, of course it will. How is that not possible? Hmm. You know, the guy who invented the ship also invented the shipwreck. You, you, can't, you can't say, I want to be an artist, but I never am willing to fail. Everybody, every art, you know, there are unsold Picasso paintings lying in garages. And there's albums that Bob Dylan made that got him booed off stage. You know, if you want to be great, you have to be prepared to fail. If you want to be mediocre, you can be consistently mediocre and never fail. And those are the two choices. Um, I'm not going to try to persuade you uh, that you... um, are great because you are. That's why you already showed up at a conference like this and why you've already put your work out there. What I need to persuade you is that part of being great, the price of being great, if you will, is you have to be prepared to fail, to be booed off stage. If you're not, then you're not going near the edge. And if you don't go near the edge, then uh, you're boring. And if you're boring, we're not going to talk about you. I would land up on my feet, you know I would just like a ninja Like to cut myself and scuba dive in the shark tank at the aquarium I like skinny dip with the alligators at the zoo I enjoy being the president